the Ides of March are upon us. So it's time for Robin Zod to talk about free enterprise again. Who knew 25 years later, free enterprise would be more relevant to society today than it was back when it got made? Anyway, enjoy tonight's late night Q&A. This is episode 96. Oh, and um, love long and party. <laughs> Do you know why that's so appropriate? <laughs> Do you know that on March 22nd, that's in three days, right? Today's the 19th. William Shatner turns 93. Yes, I know. <laughs> and I, I'm going. I'm going to see him Thursday night. I'm going you, to the. I'm going to see the premiere of his new movie. Uh, you can call me Bill. His documentary, red carpet premiere here in Los Angeles. That's going to be great. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, I thought that that was. Apropos Dude, that's amazing. And important to the show. So there we go. Amazing, amazing. Um, I am, I am just so excited uh, to be here with you tonight. You know, we've been friends for a long time. We've been streaming together for a long time, and it's been a long time since we did a stream together. So it's true. All of that is all of that is true, and. We've got some people here in the chat, so that's great. What's up, chat? Good to see everybody tonight Hello, for episode chat. 96 of Late Night Q&A. We wow. should dedicate it to Mikey, the memory of Mikey. Of course we're going to dedicate it to Mikey because, you know, and you see the Mikey icon we have up in the corner there for Mikey Sutton, Geekosity, RIP Mikey. Yeah, this is this is we this was this was it was, you know, speaking of Mikey, it was such a fun little run we had. Yes. That show on Wednesday nights. I mean, it was a lot of a lot of great stuff. And we just would just talk about everything. It was just wow. Um, yeah. You know, um, I, I was thinking about him because uh, Kurt Wallenberg, the lead singer of of uh, World Party. Uh, died recently he was 66 and world party was a band i really they had a, show, a song called ship of fools and i love that song i love two of their albums and he passed away he was only 66 and i am sure when he when i read that i'm like mikey mikey sutton i bet mikey saw them live you know i bet he knows something he would know something about wallenberg he probably so, does he probably dealt with them in the past at some point yeah yeah i'm i'm I, you know, I, I I think about all of this, and he would probably. <laughs> Rob, wait, our... somebody that somebody said Robert of the movie was kind of a loser. He was. <laughs> yeah, and so here it is: the five dollars super chat from Bat Dan's thoughts. This past Saturday, Bat Dan and I got a chance to meet each other, and we sat here in my apartment and hung out and spent Saturday afternoon. We watched Free Enterprise. We watched the Good Edition. <laughs> And Bat Dan says, I watched Free Enterprise with a friend. I have to be honest, the Robert of that movie was kind of a loser. Also, can we make this episode a musical? <laughs> well, that would be great. If we had William Shatner here, uh, we'd have him do uh, No Tears for Caesar. It's true. I, you know, was that William Shatner's idea or was that your idea, Rob, to make uh, No, no, in in that was that was totally so so how that happened was originally when we originally wrote the script, we were going to do William Shatner wanted to do a one man musical of Titus Andronicus. And our friend Alan Spencer who created the TV series Sledgehammer we gave him the script to read. He was sort of helping us, uh, consulting and telling us what we what he liked and what he didn't. He goes, you know what? People just don't know Titus Andronicus. And if you made it Julius Caesar, um, that there's more there's more comedy gold to be mined there. And so we changed it. And what was really interesting, the end of the movie was I wanted Shatner to sing Prince's song, Sexy MF, Sexy Motherfucker. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we couldn't get it. It was too expensive. So, um, and then we we're trying to, cause a lot of the movie didn't quite tie. I mean, it still doesn't quite tie together, but, but so Shatner's like, you know, guys, this is what he said. He goes, if I was going to do 
a one man musical of of Julius Caesar. It, it, what if it was a rap musical? And he was the one that said, because you know, rap is the music of the streets, and 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 that's I think it should be like a rap song. You know, iambic pentameter, Julius Caesar, and and he was like, you guys, you figure that out. <laughs> and what was so funny was. We our offices were above a recording studio, and one of Tupac's posse, Rated R, was recording an album um, with Freddie Roan, his producer. So, cracker white boy that I am, I walk down there, you know, and they're 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 recording, and I knocked on the door because I saw them all the time. They knew we we're making a pre in pre production for making a movie and stuff, and and I said, hey man, would you guys? be interested in doing a rap song with William Shatner <laughs> and, and these guys, I mean, you know, they were all strapped <laughs> they had nine millimeters and a uh, plenty of herb. And back then, you know, pot was not legal in, in California. The weed, the, 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 the great weed was not legal. <laughs> easily the way you can get them now at every street corner. So uh, they're like, well, I mean, radar said, well, we have to see if we can vibe with it. He used the word vibe. He's like, can we, if, I mean, I don't, I, I'm a serious artist. I don't want to, I don't want to, this can't be a joke. It has to be real. And so I said to Shatner, I said, okay, we found you some rappers. And we think, you know, we, we should make a song out of friends, Romans, countrymen. And Mark Altman started like writing some ideas for lyrics. And then uh, Rated R took it over and Shatner shows up one day and he shows up in a brand new, convertible green jaguar and he's blaring nwa out of the car when he pulls up just blaring it <laughs> like you know and I, I told this story a million times so stop me if you hear it so he comes in and on these guys these rappers and their producers there's probably like 15 of them they're all sitting around like schoolboys, you know with their hands in their laps really very attentive very polite I'm like, you know, and these guys had just blunts to the nth degree. And I mean, this, it, but this was different. And Shatner comes in and uh, how's it going? You know, and, and, and they're calling him William Shatner. He's like, no, 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 no. Call me Bill. Call me Bill. <laughs> and Rated R starts calling him Will just because. So he's like, Will. And then Shatner uh, gets up and he says, okay, so you guys, let me explain to you what julius caesar's all about and he says look in, in 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 roman times julius caesar posed a threat to the roman power base because he had the groundswell the support of the people you know he had he had the people behind him and he threatened the the order you know the governmental order the governmental power so they had to kill him for it he was betrayed by his friends you know the people he thought that he could trust and they betrayed him they killed him and rated r jumps up and goes man that's what happens in the hood someone gets too powerful and you gotta bust a cap in their ass i feel you will and then he he went and hugged shatner and I, we're just sitting there going like oh my god and i mean i told that's a truncated version of the story because i didn't mention the martin luther king part but <laughs> suffice to say it was crazy and Whose idea was it in the movie for Rated R to call William Shatner Hooker after TJ Hooker? I that was that his. Was a great touch too. That was his. That was that because Rated R saw William Shatner as a cop, TJ Hooker, and that was so funny. And I said to him, I go, you know, if that's how you, because the whole everybody sees William Shatner differently. And I, I said to Rated, I go, look, when you see him, you know him as five zero, and I just want you to say, whatever comes to your mind, whatever you're going to say. You know, and he was like, 5-0, Hooker, what's up? You know, and, and it was, that was hilarious. Hilarious. And it was amazing. When he said it, you know, I'm sitting behind the, the whole time we made that movie, we were howling with laughter. It was so much fun to make that movie because as hard as it was and we got rained out and all the this, this places I wanted to shoot, I didn't get to shoot. Um, But still, it was hilarious. It was really hard, but it was hilarious. So funny. I wish people could see it now. Oh my god. It would be more popular now than I think ever. I think Pe so people too. would want to cancel it or people would love it. People would want to cancel it. Yes. Yeah. Most, most 
most definitely. Now, now, you know, now people, people like myself who love it would get canceled right along with it for defending it. But I definitely, I would, I wouldn't care, Rob. I'd be right there, right on the front line, you know, with the hashtags. <laughs> oh, I, I, I mean, uh, it, the thing is, if I can get it back from our executive producer, I would put it in theaters again. You know, I would totally get because now is a perfect time to do that. I put together a new 4K release of it, put it all together, and I'd put it in theaters. You know, and and go city to city with it, it because has, it would be it'd it be hilarious. Very, very '90s authentic look. Yeah, in the way in the way that it was filmed, and every in in all of the shots, everything it has that nostalgia and that. You know, so I think it would do well today. If oh, I yeah, put I put it out tomorrow, in spite of all of the things that would you know that would get you canceled. I still think it would do extremely well, especially on our beloved physical media, Rob. I oh, mean, yeah, come on, a 4K release with a commentary from Robert Meyer Burnett and William Shatner. Yep, 93 years old, talking about you know this exaggerated parody of the man himself well and and you know he kept that going because he he hadn't done boston legal yet you know the practice in boston he hadn't made the album with ben folds and you know it's it's interesting i'm just sad that it's been 14 years since we tried to get the sequel off the ground which is a kind of a bummer it's been longer since we almost got the sequel off the ground than it was from the time we were going to make the sequel the time when the movie originally came out so um yeah, and I remember on one of the shows that we did with Mikey, we asked Chat GPT to write us a sequel for Free Enterprise, and and the, and Chat GPT gave us the seat gave us uh, Free Enterprise Two and Free Enterprise Three. It was hilarious. Should have made those too. Still can. He's still kicking. Ninety three years old. I mean, the man went to. You know what's really funny is that the end of Free Enterprise Two the the last gag of the movie and we wrote this in 2009 and 10 is that the the he he he's with Richard Branson and they go up in the last space shuttle before it's retired and now in real life he's been to space he you know he went up with blue origin so so everything that we we uh we and we couldn't even make the sequel now because it was all about bringing peace to Israel and Palestine that was his big idea <laughs> the movie i don't know how that would fly today but so now, so now the storyline would have to be would have to be changed it would have yeah. to be a more it because we couldn't be we couldn't make fun of the situation the way right we, you couldn't make fun of it but now you could now it would have to be a more grounded a more grounded story than what you originally intended not yeah. as, not as much world building Right for, for uh, the free enterprise cinematic universe that I, that I that I've also kind of hoped for in my head, <laughs> but well, yeah, I mean, well, it was funny because that was going to kind of be what we talked about doing a TV series at one point, and and you know we had different ideas. It's 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 weird to have made a movie, you know, that captured it was such a it was all about my original first ten years living in L.A. and then making a movie that was. You know, my, my entire career has been one of sputtering. You know, I've got to do these great things, but they never lead to a second thing. And I don't know if that's more of a commentary on me or I just haven't had great luck. I mean, we won awards. We traveled all around the world. I had a great time, but but I never, it didn't lead anywhere. And then after that, rather than, you know, I, I then pivoted and got a job in, in home video. You know, when I started making special features and I, was able to work on X-Men and X-Men 2. And I went and worked on Lord of the Rings in New Zealand for months at a time. And then went to New Zealand for 14 months on Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Then went over to Australia on Superman Returns for a year. And it was so I can't... I mean, in terms of being a geek or a film fan or whatever, I have had the coolest life. I just wish I could have spent more time perfecting my art. But there's still, there's still time. <laughs> Darth Plato's hilarious. Darth Plato is the official historian of my yeah, channel. Yes. And and uh uh my birthday is May 15th. 
And I, I'm still one day people just decided to wish me a happy birthday. And even when I go on someone else's show, like this show right now, people come and wish my wish me a happy birthday, even though it's not my birthday. <laughs> it's been going on for like a month. Yeah, I yeah, I well, I, I think I, I think that started because you had mentioned it sometime on your channel. I, I people got people got confused. People got confused and it just stuck. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny. But people, are, that's why I love my audience. They keep it going. They keep yeah. it going. Yeah. It, it, so. It's a, it's a legend. And, 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 you know, my, my, you know, the idea is, you know, I wanted to do this show as close to the Ides of March as possible. If not on the Ides of March, it just sort of, it just sort of fits, you know, fits the tradition and the thing I feel like. You and I have to stream about free enterprise at least once a year because <laughs> it's true. In, in my mind, I I'm going to, you know, continue to want to stream about it from year to year as long as I live, and as long as we're both alive, Rob. At, at least until free enterprise two comes. Well, out. if it, assuming I get the movie back and we can make a 4K version, we'll have a we'll have a new premiere of it, like at a theater in LA, and I yeah. I will fly you out. I'll put oh it in the budget god. to fly you out and have you come out for the. I, the... I will. I, oh my god! It'll be the the greatest thing ever. Yeah. This, this movie, I I can't. I mean, when I was when I was sitting there watching it with Bat Dan, aside from the fact that Bat Dan and I were like, we're just like shocked just to be in each other's presence physically. <laughs> that you know that's how it is when you when you meet somebody that you've been streaming with for a long time, you know, and you you you. And then you actually get to meet them in person. You know, it's it's like it's hard to get over. You know, get over that shock. You get into you get in what I like to call cyber shock. Like, you know, like wow, I can't believe it's like oh, you're not an AI. You're a real person. We're actually you know <laughs> physically around each other. It's like that. It's like what we always talk about, Rob. That human authenticity, right? Yes. And so we're sitting there human authenticity you know two friends sitting there watching free enterprise and i and i just couldn't couldn't have been happier i was in my i was in my wheelhouse because he'd never seen the movie and you know like he said in his super chat about you know rob being a complete loser and all this stuff and i'm and i'm thinking yeah i'm like you know i never thought of it like that because i related to so well, yeah. many of the elements from it that I never actually stopped to think that in today's terms, you'd look at it and you'd say, yeah, you know, Rob kind of was a loser. Well, he's, but he's written, but that, that was definitely on purpose. I mean, he yeah. was written to be, you know, it's, it's, it's really funny because now, nowadays, one of the criticisms that, that has always been leveled at the movie is that the characters are unlikable. You know, that, 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 and to me, I always like movies about unlikable characters. Like one of my favorite movies in, in the world is to live and die in LA. And William Peterson plays a complete a-hole in that movie. Oh, just, I just rewatched that movie not too long ago. It's so yeah. good. I mean, I love the movie so much, but he's a total a-hole. And, and I've always liked movies about those kind of characters. And if we were, we were writing movies about ourselves, you know, a thinly veiled version of myself, if I had written some whitewashed squeaky clean you know, Wally Cleaver type, it would have been like, first of all, that's no fun. It was, it was a lot more fun to, tr to take, cause I took all my worst traits that are true and put them in the movie, you know, because the, and, and it made it for, cause people don't, the idea was I would spend all my money on laser discs <laughs> at the time and not have money. It's, I'll figure out rent it's later. Like, it's like, it's like William Shatner. William Shatner played an exaggerated, caricatured version of himself in free enterprise yes and that was what made it so beautiful and so perfect there were traits of the real shatner in this movie but a lot of it was exaggerated yes so you would and, and and i and that's what i but when he but when bat dan kept mentioning to me about you know about not you know not really liking rob throughout the movie and then you know of you know you know he had issues of course he had issues with mark too but i i sort of i was sort of thinking like my god 
I, I it was the first time, Rob, that I'd actually kind of took my you know fanboyism out of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And started to started to look at the movie in a slightly different lens. And these are the things that you these are the things that you get from watching a movie that you love with someone who's never seen it before, yeah. never experienced it before. Because when I watched the movie, when I watched Free Enterprise with my cousin several years prior, um, he related related to it on the same level that I did because he was he's a huge he's been a huge lifelong Star Trek fan. So he got all the Shatner references mm. and all the, you know, and, you know, my favorite scene in the movie where, you know, uh, you know, she takes the, she takes the enterprise ornament and leaves <laughs> and, and leaves because it means so much to him. And I mean, that's like my favorite scene in the movie. And every time <laughs> I watch that, that, the movie, with, that actually really with, happened. Uh, every time I watch that, that movie with, with, with women, they always chuckle at that scene. Oh yeah, I mean it, it. It's it's an interesting thing because it was made. You're not supposed to like the characters, you know. I mean, the thing is, they triumph at the end, sort of. I mean, the idea that Robert gains some responsibility and throws the surprise party for Mark, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And it it. I think that. Um, that it's funny because nowadays I, I'm I would be curious like watching it with your friend and seeing from today's perspective how it would be what the reaction would be. Oh yeah, because yeah. in today's in today's I think today's audiences I think a lot of people would hate the movie, like really hate the movie. I agree. I mean I they agree. would they would they would really because they don't there there is this because it it, it is. The, the characters are pretty caustic. They say really sexist things. You know, they have, which is now we want to pretend like these things don't exist. What, what I find so interesting now is we live in a world where nobody truly wants to address the reality of anything. No. But I mean, can you imagine like today, um, uh, it would be a much different kind of. We were more honest back in the 90s, right? Way more, way more honest. I mean, I mean, what was really interesting is like when you would go out at night because no one had cell phones, you know, no one had smartphones, you had to talk to people, you know, and now you go out into Hollywood and you're meeting and we weren't, we weren't, you know, we wanted to meet other people. We went out to go and you had to chat people up. You had to have game. You had to, you know, you didn't fall back on swipe left or swipe right. You could only interest somebody if you had, you could walk up and talk to them. It's a totally different world. But it would be interesting. I I would want to put this out just I wish I could put it out now just to tweak, just to watch people get mad. People are already mad at me, you know, about half the half the it's things a, I say. It's a it's a period piece now, Rob. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that might save you if you release it from getting uh canceled, because it's a period piece. And you are accurately portraying the time period for which yeah. the movie was made. No, it's true. I mean, definitely. And it, it, in terms of being authentic, you know, I'm always talking about being authentic. It's not if it's nothing if not authentic. I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 again, it, it goes to the whole the whole concept of of, of the honesty and uh, you know you know I hopefully. Hopefully, Bat Dan's able to come on a little later tonight because I'd love for him to give some of his, you know, impressions. Oh live yeah, about the movie because there's definitely some stuff that I know, I, you know, that I know that I'm I'm gonna miss that he, you know, that he mentioned to me some some things and and I, you know, and so I very much just appreciated the idea to sit there and nerd out and watch the movie with someone else and get a different get a different perspective and this is a testament to how great of a movie i think it is i was able to get something new from it yeah watching it with batman when when it's a movie i've seen 
a gazillion times. I mean, this was a, this is a movie. I know this movie like The Wrath of Khan. I've seen it so many times. It's, like, it's not even funny. I'm like, wow. It's funny because I, I, you know, I, I've been doing this new cut of it, just playing around with edits, and but I don't watch it. You know, I, I don't watch all the way through. I do it scene by scene, and I'm just kind of working on the scenes. But it's 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 an interesting. It's a weird artifact because. It's not quite half my life ago, but but it's pretty far. It's I was a completely different person back then, and uh, you know, I since then I was married and divorced and all kinds of things. And it's 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 a wild. I mean, the world has changed as well because we were right on the cusp of the rise of the internet. You know, I mean, it was ninety nine was really to my mind the year when when people were like downloading the Phantom Menace trailer overnight. You know, and to see where we've come, where fandom has come from then to now. The last, you know, I did a show last night on my own channel. I was w reading this Twitter thread about how um, the Matrix is less relevant to people today than Back to the Future is. And, and I started to think about it because the ideas in the Matrix, some of them came true, but they're all old hat. And when you watch The Matrix now, all of that technology and everything that was so amazing when it first came out, flip phones, dial-up internet, DOS, green screens with green text, all of that's ancient history. And when you watch, and I never, it never occurred to me like that because when you live through that stuff, you know, it's like, oh, it's so groundbreaking. It was so, going to see The Matrix to me was such a, a great time at the movies because nobody knew anything about it people like ah this movie's gonna suck Keanu Reeves is in it it's gonna be like Johnny Mnemonic but it's terrible and it's so I remember sitting in that theater seeing the Matrix for the very first time it was one of the great movie going experiences of my life because I was I saw it on the Warner Brothers lot I saw it with a, a packed house of people that thought it was gonna suck you know and, and we were all seeing this theater and everybody was like seeing the eye of god in that theater going oh my god and when we when it was over everybody i mean the i think it got a standing ovation you know and that was in 99 the same year that this movie came out i think it was right before it it might have been in april i don't remember exactly when i saw it but but fandom is so fandom in the last 25 years everything has changed nothing mm -hmm. is the same there's nothing like it, you can't even you can't even remotely, and I. By the way, I think youth culture has been completely destroyed. The the youth, my time in my twenties in the nineties was phenomenal. <laughs> I mean, living in L.A. in the nineties, it was so much fun, and it was so crazy. You could, and nobody had phones, so the craziness, the craziness that happened that I saw in the nineties, one most people wouldn't believe it. And two, it'll never happen again because nobody could risk exposing themselves because everyone's got camera. I don't mean exposing themselves by taking their dicks out or something, but I mean you 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 have you have phones now, and and no one had phones before. So the parties and the things that would happen at these parties were pretty pretty out there, man. It was a lot of fun. You could never that, do it. Uh, yeah, a lot of that stuff wouldn't happen now. No way. But just to your point on the on the Matrix, I kind of disagree with society on that aspect because i feel like if anything uh the matrix planted the idea of us living in a yeah a computer simulation and yeah computer simulation, sim simulation simulacrum theory simulation theory is, is, that what the book simulation is. theory is is a big scientific thing today dude you know, and the more you look dude, into it the scarier it gets the scarier it gets because I, I i feel like it's true because they they say that the odds are more in favor of us being in a simulation than not being in a simulation. I know, and so and sort of. I, I mean, even if you start look, the more you look into it, it's. But here's the thing: the real question is, to me, it's like, it's not whether or not we're in a simulation. Let's say we know we are. Yeah. Let's say we found out we're in a simulation tomorrow. How would that affect our, the rest of our lives? I don't think it would affect anything. To be I, I I don't either. I mean, religion might change, and and I think that belief because so much of the strife that's happening that we're seeing even today in the Middle East is based on religion. You know, the, you and 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 religion is a belief in people's whole ways of life. You know, and you 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 look at you look at so much of our conflict. If we were to find out tomorrow 
Like, look, what is Dune about? Dune is about a people that have been that some a bunch of other people made up a religion, made up a bunch of prophecies. It's all a bunch of bullshit. And 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 it dropped it into this culture hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before, thousands of years before the movie started. And these people believe it's true. And we find out in the movie that it's it's a we know who did it. The Benny Gesserit Sisterhood made up these prophecies that these people believe. So, and then they're using all these made up prophecies to to position Paul Atreides to be where he is. And we know it's a bunch of BS, but they don't. And and it's such a it's such a strange it's a strange world because Frank Herbert was destroying all of our belief systems. You know, it's yeah. just that's what that's yeah, what it's so hard. And that's why you know that's why Dune is considered you know such highbrow storytelling because yeah. it challenges the very foundations for which you know entire civilizations are built so it's it's you know it's one of those things and i and so it's hard to look at it's hard to look at the matrix and not go back and watch the matrix now and not look at those look at all those elements from, well yeah and a, a lot of that are true would be considered true now <laughs> yeah and a lot of it that's what the and that's what they were the, the wachowskis were delving into was all of that school of thought yeah you know and and it's i what i love in the matrix is when joe pantaleano goes you know i i want to go back into the matrix <laughs> i want to have steak right when he has the you steak know, I wanna... he says i know it's not real i and then and then i believe the line at the end is ignorance is bliss as he takes a bite yeah. of the steak and in, and ultimately that that's exactly true though isn't it rob everything that we do we're human beings are complicated and yet and yet simple creatures all at the same time. If you put us in a simulated world where we can get everything that we want, we can get all the pleasures that we want, all of our desires are being met, and we're and again, we vote where you're always going to have those challenges. So you're always going to have that adversity you're going to have to face up against. Is it really going to matter to you if you find out, oh God, this is a simulation? Well, no, well, you still have to work. You still have things you have to do. You still have to follow the rules of the simulation. It's not like you're gonna you're gonna be able to escape it. So well, you, you know what? If you, I'll tell you what, I if we found out that we are in a simulation, the thing that I would you would get knowledge of right away is that there's probably an afterlife. Absolutely, because you know, and if somehow another part of the simulation, another or, or they recycle you, or they take like like. Uh, like I would love for somebody to stick me in like some generational starship that'll take a thousand years. Well, we live in a simulation, so it, it would be a simulated starship <laughs> going to a simulated because because the the, the it, it, it's it's funny because I've I've gone down this rabbit hole and I've been playing around. I've been really delving into the whole simulation theory thing. Quantum. Oh, how about how about this, Rob? Though quantum immortality. So you meaning there is there is no death it's just a perpetual yeah it's just a perpetual continuity with the life that you that you already live so so potentially you go on and you live your life all the way through no matter how many times you you die in one in one continuity you just continue you just continue on and it's just a cycle and yeah, well, that's, I mean, yeah, you literally, that's what reincarnation, you like, get like reincarnated. Like a video game where you just keep yeah. re respawning. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. it's like this. It's like, it's like, uh, you know, you know, people, they've been in, they've been in horrible, horrible accidents and they don't know how they survived said accident. And then they wait, you know, or they'll, and then they end up, I don't know how I survived that. And, and the theory is that, oh, well, maybe you didn't survive it. And what happened was your consciousness moved on to another reality that is in, co in continuity with the reality that you were in when you died, but your consciousness just moved to a, co a continuity where you didn't die and you continue living yeah. your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and it's it's such a weird... I mean, what I find, what I find so interesting about simulation theory is that 
the law, the physical laws of our universe, when you when you look at it and, and you think about it in terms of simulation theory, are designed to keep us here. Like we don't live, we live in a universe where uh, the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, right? Even if we could traverse the speed of light or make wormholes or whatever, and let's say we could, we, we had faster than light travel, it would still take us too long to get even to the nearest star. You know, maybe four light years we could travel the speed of light for four years constantly. But if you look at the, the universe, like the fact that we are in a place where all we can do is, is we have devices like the web telescope can see further. Well, if we're living in a simulation, <laughs> the, 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 the universe that the web is observing is going to be designed to be seen a certain way, knowing they're going to know, okay, the web telescope has reflect refracting uh, lenses or whatever that can see this far, far, far. And so the entire simulation would be designed to give the web telescope whatever it needs. Like they point the web telescope in whatever direction and the simulation will make sure that whatever it's supposed to see, it'll see, you know, and, and based on the idea that, well, if it's 13 billion miles away, well, we don't know the simulation the, the, the can adjust and make the starlight however it needs right. to be it's, in the it's, simulation. It's, render, it's rendering things based on who's observing it. Right, right, exactly. That's what, yeah. that's what scientists are proving that, like the, you know, the, that the particles. Oh, that the particle, particles react based that, on, on yeah on being observed, which is that not, part, which is not a good thing. When that's the scariest. The well, that that was the thing that put the zap on my head. Reading about that, the, the firing the electrons through the slats. Mm -hmm. That was the thing that freaked me out the most, right? Because, because if that's happening, that 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 basically gives credence to simulation theory more yeah. than anything else. Because yeah. how are how are they how are they self aware and able to uh, perform differently when being observed versus not being observed? I mean, the 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 difference in what's going on there, and not only not only acting differently, it becomes it becomes a wave. You know, it, yeah. and, and it perpetuates it's, out of it's and like, they, a, like and, a caterpillar turning into a butterfly at will. Like what? And when I was when I was watching this video, I, I, it was funny because I don't know why I got in on simulation theory. It was one of those things where Elizabeth had gone to bed and I was in our movie room, you know, my little home theater, home cinema. And um, I, I sit there and I'm watching, you know, YouTube videos and you go down. I go down these rabbit holes where I'm like watching these scientists talk. And one of them was this scientists explaining this this thing you know this this property of this experiment that that you, is by the way they can repeat it whenever they want it's not like it only happens once whenever they set up the experiment it happens exactly the same way and then on that video there was some doctor talking about some dn geneticist or something and he was talking about genetic code and when you when you delve deep enough it's binary like our DNA is just binary like code, compu like computer code, <laughs> like yeah. computer code, and like they they want to run it. They're gonna get that code out and they're gonna run the code and see what they come up with. I'm just like I can't. I'm out. I can't. That, that, means, that mean that would mean if that's if that's you know the case. What that essentially means is that we are essentially digital beings, and that everything is yes, and that everything that we're that we feel, everything that we believe in, every it's all. It's all simulated. We're well, all basically programs at that point. Yeah. And what the craziest thing about that experiment is it didn't matter how, like they could set up a camera mm -hmm. and it would change anything that observed as, and, but if you took the camera away and you took away the people looking at it, it became a wave, you know, and that was the thing it knew. How does it know if a person's watching or if a camera's seeing it? That was the thing that freaked me out. Like, it's not like Schrodinger's cat when you, you know, so it, is it in the box or is it not in the box? You know, the state of being observed. This is even beyond that. Like, it knows when it's being observed by anything, whether it's an electronic device or human eyes. Uh, and that that was what I'm like. I can't even. I'm so and have, out. And they have the ability, and they literally have the ability to travel to each other and communicate with, through any distance, instantaneously. <laughs> How does that make any sense if it if it's if we're living in a 
physical well, I, world that doesn't make sense well you're... because because we are we are but but everything around us like everything is the matrix you know that's yeah. what simulacrum yeah. what is it simul what is the name then i want to find out the name of the book because it's a certain book um uh it, it's a book that uh yeah okay it's it's simulacra and simulation and yeah. it is a book it's a 1981 philosophical treatise by the philosopher and cultural uh theatist, theorist jean uh boudriard and um that's where the the matrix ideas um um a lot of it came from yeah and so it's really interesting. I mean, but but that's that's the funny thing because if you think about what are we doing now when you're playing an open world video game like Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead Redemption, you know, or Cyberpunk 2077, or right? Whatever. You, know, you kind of use they kind of a lot of simulation theory. You know, they you a lot of them, a lot of these scientists now are using video games as a template to make their argument, like what you just pointed out about open world well, video games and, and virtual reality. If we have the ability to create these types of worlds ourselves, uh -huh. then that just, then that just increases the, uh, the, the idea that, yeah, we're living in a simulation. Well, and if you think about that's the whole point. If you think about like where sandbox video games have come from, look at, just take the grand theft auto franchise. Look at like the original Grand Theft Auto, which is like a top-down, you know, primitive like two thousand yeah, video very game. primitive, like micro machines. You see, yeah, the little yeah, <laughs> yeah. And by the time you get to Grand Theft Auto three, you've made an exponential jump. Grand Theft Auto five came out what ten years ago, eleven years ago or something. Now imagine where that technology, an open world uh, sandbox video game, would be in a thousand years with quantum computing. I mean, it, then you start and go, oh, and and then the question becomes: so why would somebody create a simulation of the past, like where we're living now? Because let's assume it takes a thousand years for them to get to the point where they could build a simulation like this. So the whole point would be if you run a simulation because of all the different, you know, hundreds of billions of things that happen every day differently, every time you ran the simulation, things would happen differently. You know, like somebody would be one place at one time and they wouldn't be in that place at another time. So every time you turn the simulation on, the point would be to see how does your civilization progress? Exactly. So, and what if they were running the simulation from 10,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago to 10,000 years from now to see where humanity came? And what's crazy is they can run it at whatever speed they want, but we only perceive it at one speed. So they could be watching... 10,000 years because they're plotting the rise and fall of civilization. Don't, don't you and, feel like but don't you feel like time is progressing faster? Well, what the, and when we sleep, well maybe the simulation has to have half the planet or a third of the planet always has to be sleeping so that the that part doesn't the world doesn't have to render except it knows when people are awake, but when people are awake what at night? It's night. You don't have to render the sky as much. You know, you have stars, but that's easy because that's an that's easy why, cover. That's why so many of us are night owls, Rob. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's it, it it's so weird when you start going. The funny thing about it is when you start delving into simulation theory, it's more plausible than the idea Any, that I anything mean, else. It's yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, crazy. It's wild. It's crazy. Well, getting back to free enterprise, uh, Bat Dan's thought says, if there was a sequel that took place today. Would Mark and Robert be Snyderverse supporters? Oh yeah, yeah. But 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 once we saw Zack Snyder's Justice League, we'd be like, awesome, we got it, we won, fandom won. They they would they would not be. And then when Zack Snyder makes a deal with Netflix to go make his his own movies, they would be supportive of that too. Like, look, I saw the trailer for. Uh, I, I was not a fan of Rebel Moon. I have to tell you, and. However, that said, I'm very curious to see the director's cut because Zack Snyder himself said it's a totally different movie. It's a totally different thing. Yeah. And and I can't wait and to see I, it. I read, I read the novel for Rebel Moon, which is based on the director's cut of yeah, Rebel yeah. Moon, and it's fantastic, Rob. It, it got me to the point where I felt like we were cheated watching 
the version that came out on Netflix. Yeah. And in reality, it should have just been, I mean, I understand the financial reasons and the, and the, the whole PG 13 creating a franchise and making it more viable for all audiences. But to me, what we really want to see is Zach's true vision for this brand new IP and this whole in this whole universe that he's building. And I, and so for me, I was just, I was just blown away. I'm like, my God, it's not, it's night and day difference. Like, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm, I would assume. So I'm, do we have a date when the, when the first part, part one, the director's cut of part one comes? I, I thought they, I thought they said that the, the, the director's cuts were coming, were coming after the, uh, like right after part two comes out. Yeah, so I, yeah, I'll be yeah. curious because I'll, I mean, they, Zach said they're going to dump, they're going to dump them both out at the same time. So yeah. you're going to get the director's cut of part one and part two. I mean, I can understand that because you know you get you get two bites at the at the tr- you get two bites at the dinner table. So, yeah, you know they make mo- they make more. Mo- I mean, Netflix gets more out of it that way too. I mean, it's like it's like with it's like with you. I, I look at it like okay, you know, the original, the first cut of Free Enterprise is still good, but when you watch, you know the. The, yeah, I mean, the, and, well, the, we didn't. The other, the you know, the five year mission <laughs> edition. You're kind of like, well, I'll never go back to no that version. Ever well, that's again. why. Yeah, that's why I would. People are like, are you going to put all the different versions of Free Enterprise? And I'm like, no, uh, it, because when I the the version that <laughs> I would, gonna, it's going to be like a Brazil box set. You're going to have all no these versions. no because <laughs> if the movie was if the movie was, I wouldn't. I would do a definitive version because there's things in it that. I just, I didn't know how to do, you know, as the editor and we were all too, pr- and I had to work with other people and make them happy. Now I don't have to do that. And I would, I would just make the movie that we made and I would be able to put it together. Cause I've just learned so much more about making movies in the last, um, the last 25 years. And it's, it's frustrating because the movie never really got out there it was from a small company and and no one and if we had had if the movie had come out five years later i think it would have been a much bigger success and what's also a bummer is that new line cinema wanted to buy it but one of my producers didn't want them to because we would have had to open up the movie and make their note take their notes i'm like let's take their notes then why not i mean if it had come out they'd put it out and um yeah so I, I, you know, I, and, uh, and, uh, Darth Plato points this out. Also, Rob, Rob also started a show with the banner as remembering William Shatner. So people came into the chat saying, oh, I be William Shatner. <laughs> oh my God. I'm always remembering William Shatner. I, I, I mean, <laughs> how, how can you not? I mean, it's, it's one of the, you know, you know, free enterprise is the ultimate, is the ultimate tribute to William Shatner. I would say, and this is just as, as a big Star Trek fan, I would say that with, for William Shatner, you know, his best roles for me are Captain Kirk and Bill from Free Enterprise. Because with Captain Kirk, you have the you have just the the ultimate the ultimate starship captain, and I don't care what anybody says, Captain Kirk as portrayed by William Shatner is the captain for Star Trek. I I just to me I don't You're going to get no argument from me. I I, 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 I am not I, I I will never budge on that. But number 2 but number 2 is Bill and Free Enterprise which is essentially the accentuated parody of William Shatner himself. So to me I feel like those are Shatner's best roles. Period. <laughs> yeah, well it's interesting now because um you know there's so much star trek and and star trek's kind of like james bond now it's when you whenever you yeah. first came to the franchise but what i what i uh what what's frustrating now is that the original star trek tos is star trek everything else is derivative of that so to truly understand what star trek was supposed to be you can say oh star trek is all things to all people now that's fine to say, 
But you really have to go back and ask yourself, well, what was the original intent by the original creators at the time it was made? And I think that what's happened in with modern Star Trek is it's moved too far away from that. You know, they're they're trying to make Star Trek more about today's audiences than they are about the concept. And I think that's the that's that's problematic to me because you know, when you turn something into a franchise, then the core ideals of what that franchise was supposed to be have have gone away. Like to take it back to Zack Snyder's uh rendition of Justice League, for instance. Like I'm a huge, I was a huge Man of Steel fan. And and a lot of people, I didn't understand. I found it very interesting when Man of Steel came out. I really loved it because it was a science fiction, it was more of a science fiction take. You know, you had Superman being more of an alien coming to Earth, more of a man who fell to Earth kind of a vibe. And then when you were actually dealing with the reality of two Kryptonians fighting in an urban environment, that's like the most terrifying, scary thing ever. And one of the things that I thought was so weird to me was that people were mad that Superman, like people were getting killed and so many bystanders. And I'm like, what What did you think was going to happen? Like this idea that that Superman, who's now been Superman for a week, it, it, he's, he's trying to stop the earth from being destroyed. And, and he, a week ago, if you asked him, would he be fighting Kryptonians over the skies of Metropolis? He would have been like, what? You know, and, and, and I, so many, I think audience members were, did not like that. Like their image of Superman. I'm like, no, 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 no. Zack Snyder has now put a, if there was really a Kryptonian on earth right now, what would that Kryptonian be like? Not movie Kryptonian or not animated Kryptonian or not comic book Kryptonian, but real Kryptonian in our world today. And he had to fight another Kryptonian. What would that look like? It would be terrifying. And and that's what I loved about like the end of the film when you're seeing how and I thought one of the most my, one of my favorite things in any movie is how they open Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice with Bruce Wayne's perspective of that same battle. As a fanboy, when I saw that, I'm like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Why? Because you're seeing how terrifying the perspective is from the ground level. But I love the fact that the most Batman thing in the world in any movie ever is Bruce Wayne in his three-piece suit running into trouble. Not even as Batman. I'm like, that's the most Batman thing I've ever seen in a Batman most movie. Batman thing ever, ever. Ever. Exactly. Bruce Wayne in his suit running to the Wayne Enterprises building to save the life of the people that work for him. And, and, and I'm like, that is the core essence of who Batman is. Not to mention... The warehouse fight's one of the coolest things ever, too. Uh, exactly. But, but like, not, like right out of the Arkham games, right out of the comics, one of the greatest aspects you would ever see. And with that, because now, yeah, you 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 decided to talk about Batman. I thought that this would be a good time to bring in Bat Dance thoughts. Who watched Free Enterprise with me this past weekend? <laughs> well, I thank you for watching. Back, I appreciate that. No problem. It was a great movie. I really liked it. And yeah, it would totally be canceled if it came out today. But <laughs> but then again, any movie that's realistic that takes place in the 90s that came out today would be. Because humans were not PC in the 90s. Sorry, no. people. We, we weren't. weren't we weren't PC for the 10,000 years before today. <laughs> we lived in a nope. horrible, horrible place. So yeah, yeah. It, it's it's definitely uh a different a different reality now and like like we said earlier rob people were more honest back in the 90s now it's not that people don't still feel the same way about a lot of things they just are smart enough not to voice those feelings right <laughs> that's all that's link, changed really <laughs> link social media but that's the problem is it gave certain people platforms who shouldn't have platforms and you we're afraid to say something on social media because our boss has a chance of seeing that, seeing something, and then we're going to lose our job or, or, you know, you're a director of a movie, you, you say something offensive, then fans are going to organize a boycott. It's all social media. We have social media to blame for this. Well, what, uh, what what's so strange though, is that people think the weirdest thing to me is that people think if somebody says something that they don't like, like just whatever they want to say, like, that then it's okay to go after somebody and like <clears throat> try and take away their livelihood. Like 
this is a weird, this is something new that didn't exist. Like you see people who will go after other people and try and like, you don't know if somebody's taking care of their mother, who they put their mother in a, in a, in a nursing home and have to pay for that nursing home every month. And someone out, out there is trying to destroy your livelihood, take away your job, get you canceled. And it's weird to me that we have a whole activist. We have a whole culture of people that get their, their sense of worth from from going after other people that they deem as being unworthy for whatever reason. And it's my job to make sure that that person is destroyed for whatever reason. And that's terrifying. And they, they all they now have groups of people that will pat them on the back for doing it. And they haven't created anything. They haven't made anything new. They've just destroyed somebody else for whatever perceived crime they've committed and 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 so much of the literature of the 20th century especially in science fiction fantasy and horror was warning against just that kind of behavior and it's wild to see it happen so uh, so so bad dan now that you're here with me and rob i wanted to get some of your thoughts on the movie on free enterprise since you finally had a chance to watch it and and again i have to reiterate that it was a a joy not just seeing you but being able to sit down and actually watch that movie with you and get your first time reactions to everything that you know that happened on screen i i i loved every moment of the experience I did too, and it's just so weird now, like, watching you on this screen, it's like, I know what's to the left and what's to the right of you right now. I know that, like, what's around that couch. I know the actual size of that couch. It's it's so weird now. But in terms of free enterprise, I actually don't think Mark was a loser. Mark was a winner. He had a job. And you know what? I can support anyone who has a job and can take care of himself. You know what? Ain't a loser. Rob, on the other hand, in the movie... As much as I say he was a loser, and he definitely was a loser, it felt like it was good for the story, at least. He was an unlikable character, but at least he was supposed to be un an unlikable character. Well, he did lose his job in the movie. You know, he just... <laughs> By not showing up to work constantly. Yeah, yeah. The real I, Rob never least... does that, though, just so you know. <laughs> that was something that was created for the film. Um, I was one of the last people at that company. <laughs> But yeah, no, and he's yeah the real he's, Rob. The real Rob is definitely not flaky like Rob in the film. Oh no, I'm flaky in a different way. Yeah. My my problem is I have ten thousand things going at once. You know, and I, I've I've I it's hard. I it's I want to do all these things, and I, I it's hard to keep them all going. Uh, and uh, Sharon Peters wants to know. I, I Sharon Peters, it's so great to see great to see you. It's been a long time since you've been in the chat. Sharon Peters wants to know, is there a free enterprise triple X parody? I really want to know this too, since you did do, you did do the star Wars, uh, triple X parody. You were, yeah, there, there is as, not. you know, so I mean, I mean, the, it was going to be more explicit. I was written to be a more explicit movie, but, um, <laughs> I, I, there's never been a, a free enterprise triple X parody. The funny thing is, is I really did want to have really explicit, sex in the film but i think it would have worked against the movie of course you know it would have it, yeah, it, it you, you have you have to you have to there's just enough i mean you have to like it was written this is terrible this is terrible but you know there's a scene there's a three there's a threesome scene that you don't see you see the beginning of it and you see the aftermath of it yeah but yeah. it was written it was written it was written where these two guys are are having sex with their lovely lady Kira, the girl actress who played played, Kira, the, yes. played the girl Kira and, and Kira Deanda. And at one point, the the Sean character looks up at Rob and goes, like in the middle of it, goes, "Dude, high five. And they high five over her back. <laughs> I'm so glad we didn't shoot that. <laughs> if it would not have it would not have gone over well but I, I but i kind of mm -hmm. but i you know rob i kind of disagree there because i think i don't <laughs> think that that not having those scenes would have changed anything because look at where the movie is now 
It, it's true. And well, I don't know. But yes, it's kind of a, it's forgotten. But in the movie itself, it would have been unbalanced because already, especially what was what was the big criticism of the movie when it came out was everyone thought, oh, this is such wish fulfillment. How can these nerds get laid all the time? And I'm like, well, you're, you should come to L.A. <laughs> and 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 yeah. live live in Los Angeles <laughs> in the 90s. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Not as difficult as people think. Uh, yeah, I don't. And, and the thing was, the 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 nerd. I I, I mean, we were we were very. I, I mean, my friends and I were like the like the, we were in the movies. I mean, we were out of the club, the clubs all the time. You know, we were meeting girls all the time. Well, if well, I, well, you were, you were, you were, you know, balancing your time between the clubs a- at night and Toys R Us during the day. It's, well, it's, it's sort of, you know. I mean, I could make a whole other movie, a less than zero version of Free Enterprise, you know, that is this decadent Bacchanalian, people would never believe it, but it was all true. It was all true. Like, like there was, I'll tell you something, and nobody believes this is true, but I, I can tell you it was. There was a restaurant. So, so Wilshire Boulevard is a main thoroughfare in Los Angeles that you can drive. You can go all the way to the beach down Wilshire. It's, it's parallel to Santa Monica Boulevard at most at, at one point, but you can take Wilshire from the beach all the way to downtown LA. So it's a main thoroughfare and there's different neighborhoods it goes through. And there's Koreatown, which is where large Korean population lives. A lot of Korean restaurants, a lot of karaoke bars, great place. There was a, this is in the early 2000s. There was a bar, there was a restaurant in, in Koreatown that this was after free enterprise came out, by the way, but there was another place like it that was similar after two o'clock it would close. And if you knew where it was and you knew you could go in there it was a cocaine speakeasy. So you would go in there and you could, you could sit at tables and waitresses brought cocaine, like laid out in, in rails and you could do drugs. And it was, I mean, it was, it was insane that it even existed. And the people that you would see there, I mean, it was a who's who it was crazy. And the thing is, nothing like that could ever exist because not anymore, because no one could, you could never have a phone in there. And this was pre smartphone. And, you know, nobody was taking out flip phones and flip phone phones didn't really work in the dark anyway. So it was crazy. Now, I'm sure there's equally crazy stuff going on, but people have to be a lot more careful. It's a lot different. So the, the environment that, that LA was in the nineties and early two thousands is totally different now. And plus I, I got grew up and left that sort of behind, but you could make that version of the movie too. And it would be, uh, you know, because it was this very Bacchanalian hedonistic, but most of all fun, you know, now, now I wouldn't want to, it's, it seems everything is so dangerous. Now LA was fun. The nightlife, you look at a movie like one of the things, one of the biggest inspirations for Free Enterprise was the movie Swingers, you know, with John Favreau. And, of course. And Swingers, <laughs> that, because I knew those guys, like, you know, I knew because Peter Billingsy was really good friends with them and I was working with Peter. So I knew Favreau and, and Vince Vaughn before they broke through and made Swingers. But Swingers was probably, for me, the most influential movie. But Swingers showed just how much fun, I mean, what what la life was like because i had an enormous amount of fun i i had an incredible the level of fun i had for about 15 years was off the charts spectacular i mean all the way from i'd say all the way from junior high school to my 30s (laughs) i had a lot of fun so i there was there was no stone left unturned and i can't and that was one of the things about free enterprise that You know, when I saw Swingers, I'm like, okay, we could make a movie. We could combine Swingers with Star Trek. That was the that was the original impulse. Could we do that? And I'm like, we tried with Star Trek and overall fandom, geek fandom, yeah, movie fandom, uh, laser disc, physical media fandom. um, You know, Toy R Us action figure. You know, and the thing that it was all. Yeah, I mean, the thing that it was hard, it's hard to explain to people, but in the 90s in LA, you had the independent film explosion that began in the late 80s, where you had like Steven Soderbergh coming on the scene with Sex, Lies, and Videotape. You had Spike Lee with She's Gotta Have It. 
And then we move into the 90s and you had Quentin Tarantino with Reservoir Dogs and Kevin Smith with Clerks. And so there was all these people coming to L.A. and everybody was interested in making stuff. So there was this incredible amount of optimism and energy and creation. And people were people were doing all kinds of things like for me. Um, you know, I was working with Peter Billingsley editing a movie in, in, in 93. And then we started a production company. We started making music videos and we were doing industrial videos and we were just making stuff. And it was incredibly creative and it was incredibly energizing. And it was, it was so, it was all kind of the same one day bled into the other. And, and, you know, you'd work for 12 hours on a movie, editing a movie, like we'd work on this full moon movie arcade. And then we'd go out to the club. You know, and then we'd, we'd party all night long. We'd drag ourselves out of bed and we'd be back in the edit bay at 9 a.m. So you, you had this incredibly, um, it was it was both an incredibly fun place to be and then also very creatively gratifying. So, and it, it all worked together and everybody around you was trying to do the same kind of thing. So, and nobody, there wasn't any rivalry because there was no social media. So there was no, you didn't really know what anybody else was doing. And when you'd cross paths and start talking about what you were doing, no one was interfering with everybody else. And you just share either your frustration or your excitement. So there was a whole, it was a, it was a great time to be, um, to be, I guess, young and to be in Los Angeles. It was a great time to be there because it was like swingers. It was, it was so much fun. And we were, we were young and, and, and dreaming and we could just make stuff happen. And it was happening. People were making stuff happen all the time. You were going to music video shoots or you were going to short film shoots or you'd wind up on a field or somebody would have, there was, I remember there's a Dario Argento film festival at Raleigh studios and Dario Argento came and was, and was speaking in front of all of his movies. And I'm outside and they were going to show deep red and we're all like hanging outside between screenings. And it was a Raleigh cinemas. And it, there was, you know, it's just a couple hundred people there and Tarantino shows up. He wants a ticket for deep red. I'm like, Oh bro, he didn't, couldn't get one. I go take my ticket, you know, and he did, <laughs> he went in and saw deep red or whatever. And, and that was the kind of thing you were fraternizing with all these people. And they, they, they weren't, the gods that they've become and everybody was intermixing and intermingling. So it was all like one big creative thing. So the idea of running into William Shatner at a bookstore and then talking to him was not, I mean, it was far fetched, but it wasn't as far fetched as you might think it was. So had it personal was, lives. Yeah. I mean, it was, and the thing, the thing about it was, is, is that geek life, all the geeks that came to LA, during that time came there to work. So like when we, when, when, when Chris Gore and Mark Altman started sci-fi universe magazine for Larry Flint of all the, the porn, the hustler King himself also published all these Dom pornographic magazines. So when I became the critic at large for sci-fi universe magazine, we had this office in Larry Flint's building and it was insane. It was insane that you had, porn stars and porn magazines up against video games magazines like tips and tricks up against sci-fi universe up against car magazine it was crazy so here we had this magazine we're writing for sci-fi universe going to conventions but at the same time we're out partying i mean it was insane and there we were publishing the magazine for sci-fi fans with a life that was what it was called the the cool geeks and everybody came to to la it was wild man it was it was a wild time and and the internet killed that all. It uh, social media killed it all off, yeah. because because you no longer had to go do you in order to have this kind of life, you had to go out and do it. You had to make it happen, and like you would go out and you'd never know where you were going. It's like where are we going to go tonight? I don't know. Let's go find out. And I had a friend. He's passed away, but my friend Sean, who Patrick Van Horn plays in the movie, Rob's best friend. In real life, we had a motto. And our motto was, it's not in the movie, but our motto was, whatever comes our way. Meaning that wherever, in, in like swingers, they're always looking for the best party. My attitude with Sean was, doesn't matter where we are, if there's no party happening, we're going to start it. And we would. And and that that kind of thing, and it, it spilled over into our work life. It's like, okay, well, what do we, what do we want to do? Well, let's start a magazine. Okay you know who can we get to be in it and, and chris gore and mark altman did that chris had film threat you know mark was writing for cine fantastique they got together because all 
all the geeks in LA know each other. That's how come, like, you know, I've known Chris Gore for 35 years. And it's like we're on, we stream on YouTube together. It's hard. I, I, it would be so funny to try and explain how many of these people I've known for decades. <laughs> it's crazy. And I mean, to make a version of Free Enterprise now with, uh, with all the, because there, there is the film YouTube contingent. A lot of these people now know each other, whether it's, you know, Jeremy Johns, Karloff, um, um, you know, Campy, obviously I, 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 John Schnepp brought me onto YouTube. And so I, I, and, and, and Chris Gore, and then meeting Gary Nerdrotic and knowing streaming with the critical drinker. I mean, all these people, it's a really small world, really. And it's kind of the same. It reminds me, the only difference is we can't get together because everyone's scattered all over the planet. So it's just sort of, uh, it's the same, it's the same concept yeah, just on a just on a bigger, less intimate scale. In and we don't get to we don't get to have the fun together. Yeah. We don't get to have the fun. We don't we 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 don't leave work. The the fun is the work. You know, yeah. the hanging out is the also stream like what we're doing right now. Right, but we don't get now. to go to bars and hang out and go to parties and meet girls and dream up projects and so it's it's it the difference is everyone sitting in front of their computers or their screens. And people are missing out about living life part, which is it's odd and I. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean that it's 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 wild. I want to see. I mean, I've been thinking about how do you bring that back. I mean, I'm an old man now, but how do you bring back? And I have to say, like Gary Beekler, Nerdrotic, I went to his. Um, he had a meetup. He has these meetups in different cities. And I figured, well, what was that like? What's a meetup like? So it was at CinemaCon. I was in Vegas anyway. So I went, there was hundreds of people there. I met a dude that rode his motorcycle down from Edmonton, Canada to go to this meetup. And Gary's a really generous guy. So what he does is he brings a taco truck in, buys everybody tacos. Hundreds and hundreds of people tacos. Buys every, he doesn't even drink. Buys everyone drinks. You know, and everybody there... It, is it's this is the funny thing people come after me like you're friends with people that are so hateful and toxic and i'm like you got to go to one of these meetups man because everybody's it's like a love fest you meet people some guy flew in from thailand you're meeting people from all over the world and it's an all-day event it's incredible i mean it's incredible to meet these people it's like having a, a going to a convention but there's no convention it's just a meetup for people that watch his channel and i was blown away by it i was like wow this is incredible and I, i've often thought we should do more of this. Like if my channel, if I made more money on my channel, uh, once a month, I would go to different cities and throw an event like that. That'd be awesome. Man. I know. I would just go from city to city. And you know what? I'd rent out a theater. I'd show, make it a whole day long thing. Have a party at some bar, feed everybody, then bring them to a theater and show them free enterprise and then continue the party afterwards. I would just do that because meeting all these people, you know, you think about how many people are on YouTube Gary just passed a million subscribers this week. I know, a million, I saw that. I was like, a wow, million people. Insane. Like, there's a. If you think about that, and Critical Drinkers, almost two million people, and we're all streaming with. When you go to these places, and you you think, are is anyone going to show up? When when John Campia did his hundred million views party, I'm like, who's going to come to this? Sold out. It was like people came to this. We rented out this little theater, packed. People brought us cookies. It was amazing. And, and the thing is, what is not being tapped into is we are a strong community of literally millions of people. And, and when we all get together, there isn't rivalry and people aren't, there's no beef between each other. No one's going, well, you're toxic. Everyone's having a great time. We need to do more of that. We need to take the communities that we've built, like the, the, the support the Snyder Cut community, you know, when you ever have meetups at various events like conventions and things like that, people are people are so happy to see each other. Everybody's having a good time. We should, there you go. I mean, we should do figure out ways as a community to do more of that. And and not just at other people's events. Like, okay, we're gonna go to the San Diego Comic Con, but we're getting to the point where we can control it. You know, during COVID, these guys out of Chicago were putting on these conventions, and I was interviewing a lot of people at the conventions, and they were great. You know, and now with the internet, you can get people to show up. They'll show up. They'll come. It's great. We should do more of that. 
<laughs> that would be amazing. I, I just keep I, I keep thinking about how great it's going to be to one day see Free Enterprise in a movie theater. I'm just like getting hyped. I yeah, I'll get burned at the stake. Oh, by by young leftist activists. Uh, well, see that that's oh, oh, fuck that's, them all. <laughs> it's just like wow, you know what? I don't know. Um, uh, Sox Bulletin wants to know. I wonder what Rob thinks of the new trailer, The Alkalite, for Disney Plus. Here's the thing. Okay, go watch the second trailer for Andor. Whether you liked Andor or not. And 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 focus on what that trailer tells you. So here's the thing: you've got to you've got to show that the premise of the acolyte. You've got a female character who's a a, a Sith or learning about. It. She's an acolyte of the dark side of the Force. That's a great idea. I was really excited to see this. A trailer. So we've never seen the High Republic era, and if you haven't read the comics, or you know, if you're just a casual fan. When I watched that trailer, I'm like, that trailer was surprisingly uninvolving. People are like, oh, it's Carrie Ann Moss, and she's a Jedi, and there's a Jedi Wookiee and all that stuff. Okay, all of those things, it, I, it looked like I was watching a trailer for Dark Horse Comics circa 1994, like Tales of the Jedi or something. And I'm like, what, what is this about? Tell me what this is about. Like, where are we? Why is this different than any other thing? Who are these people? What is going on here? I mean, if this and if you watch the Andor trailer, it's all these different characters, and you hear from them, you hear their voices, they're talking to each other, you you get a sense of place, you get a sense of purpose, you understand what this show's about. I don't know what the show is about, other than the fact that it looks like how if Ahsoka showed up, wouldn't surprise me. And I looked at this and I want to love this show, but I'm like, how do you make a show about something we haven't seen before, which is a somebody who's steeped in the dark side, who's adept in the dark side or whatever. And it starts out with younglings training. What do you see when you shut your eyes? I'm like, we've seen that. You're, you're, why are you showing us something that we've seen before? Younglings training. Show us something we haven't seen. Why am I supposed to watch that show? And, and look, I know people love Star Wars and they're going to watch it. I love Star Wars too. And I've loved it. I was there. I saw Empire Strikes Back 26 times in the theater. Literally, I love Star Wars, but I haven't seen good Star Wars in a long, long time because here's the thing. My feeling about Star Wars is George Lucas was looking at things because Star Wars didn't exist. He was looking at Kurosawa. He was reading Joseph Campbell. He was looking at all of these things to influence what it would. Dune was a huge influence on, on Lucas making Star Wars. Yep. So now I feel all we're getting when you look at Star Wars we're just looking at Star Wars regurgitating itself. Whereas all the people that when Star Wars was originally conceived, it was inspired by all of these other things. Now Star Wars is only inspired by Star Wars. So I feel it doesn't have very much to say. There's nothing, there's no there there. You know, and I I if I'd made that trailer, if I'd made the show, if, if but I would have I would have given us, I would have shown us something we haven't seen. What does the galaxy look like? We've seen Coruscant, but the High Republic is, you know, it's it's the the land of like what Mako says at the beginning of Conan. It's the land of high or the time of high adventure. You know, he does that speech. We don't know it's the High Republic era. We don't know anything about it. You know, and and so when it starts, I'm like, what what is this? Why am I supposed to watch this show? And I don't think the acolyte people are like, well, Rob, it's just a trailer. I'm like, no, it's not just a trailer. If you look at Andor, the second Andor trailer, that trailer's a banger. You can't wait to watch that show. And forget what you think of how it turned out, but the acolyte, I'm, I was watching it going, I don't understand what this show is supposed to be about. I thought it was about the Sith. So why am I watching a bunch of Jedi? Who cares? I've seen the Jedi. Tell me about the Sith. I want to see the story. Give me the story of whoever that female character is and tell me about the Sith. If you did a trailer that was all about that, that would have been interesting to me. But now I'm watching a trailer that, oh, somebody's trying to kill the Jedi. Good. Kill them all. I don't like any of those Jedi. Kill them all. I want to see a Sith Lord rise to power and tell me about the Sith. I want to know about the Sith. What do they want? I still don't know. I've been watching Star Wars since 1977. I have no idea what the Sith want. 
other than the fact they're generically evil. If they're smart, they'll they'll no, they're not. If they're smart, they'll turn it around on us and make the Sith the good guys. Who are the good guys? I've always said they're the good guys. I, I mean, the Sith are the only people that embrace their human nature or their nature. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and and you know what? The Jedi are idiots. They let the Sith rise up right right amongst them, right in front of them, right behind them. You know, I mean, Palpatine rose to power, became chancellor, uh, invoked war powers, turned the Republic into an empire over. I, I mean, the, the Jedi deserve to be vanquished. It's They're idiots. If you watch Clone Wars, if you watch Clone Wars, there's so you see how stupid they really are. They literally had a clone warn them about the inhibitor chips about Order 66, and they didn't listen. Uh, it's such a it's such a weird thing i mean it, it's funny i you know nowadays it, it, i often think that the end of return of the jedi you know we can end this destructive conflict and rule the galaxy as father and son what he says in empire it would have been nice to see that paid off that vader kills the emperor and then luke he looks at luke and says let's get to work <laughs> then the movie's go. over that would have been awesome <laughs> you know i mean i be, be, because um but um, wasn't the original ending Luke was supposed to become Darth Vader? Wasn't that the original ending of Return of the Jedi? I don't know, but I don't know about that necessarily. But um, I just, I, I, I just, I, I look at the and the acolyte. By the way, it looks so cheap. It looks like it's you know there's no the the Andor there's no money left. There's no the money Andor left. trailer shot on locations. It looks like Star Wars. This to me looked like bargain basement Star Wars. It looks like the Roger Corman version of Star fan, Wars. A fan film. Yeah, uh, it really a, did. A very low. I haven't even seen the trailer film. yet. It's. I mean, the funny thing about it is, it, it it's the most generic milk toast Star Wars thing because. It's not telling it. There's nothing. Why am I supposed to watch it? What is a great trailer makes an audience go? I have to. It poses a question. You show an audience a bunch of stuff and they want to know what's going to happen. I wonder what's going to happen here. I wonder what's going to happen here. I wonder what's going to happen here. That trailer does not ask any questions. It, there's nothing in it that you, it doesn't, it, it failed to me as a trailer. And it's not, you know, a lot of people, it's not because of the the, the racial makeup of the characters. I don't care about that. Uh, I, I mean, Star Wars, is a it's got a bunch of aliens in it, so who cares? I, I don't care about any of that. What I want is a great story. Give me a great story and great characters. That trailer, we're supposed to get excited about Carrie Ann Moss because it's Carrie Ann Moss. I want to get excited about the character Carrie Ann Moss is playing. And she doesn't say anything. There's no dialogue in the trailer other than people saying, we don't know why this is happening. Tell me who these characters are. Who are they? What are they like? Give me a sense of their personality. If you watch the Andor trailer, you get all of that in spades. You see everything you need to know. It starts with a voiceover from Cassie and Andor. And it explains how, you know, the whole thing's about how does the re rebellion start? And I think those are great. It's a great juxtaposition if you want to see the difference between a good trailer and a bad trailer i think and it's not that the acolyte was a bad trailer I, I mean i think it is a bad trailer but it doesn't it doesn't do what a trailer is supposed to do which creates and foments fervor in the audience that to and people are now like well we're gonna get another trailer i'm like no 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 no. you have to assume that every trailer you make is the only trailer people are going to see you can't you can't we as film fans are waiting. We know there's going to be a second trailer, but most people aren't. You're never going to get a second chance to make a first impression. There nope. Exactly. You either know what you're doing. It's like when you kiss a girl. A girl knows in a split second, does this guy know how to kiss or not? And once you, uh. once you, once, once you prove that you can't, you're out. You're out. The girl's like, okay, I'll continue on. But this guy, he doesn't know how to kiss. And after that, you're dead in the water. You got to know what you're doing, otherwise, what, how do you expect to succeed? And that trailer, Star Wars needs. I I want Star Wars to succeed. I think we all do. Yeah. And I, you know, the Let's acolyte make the sequels not canon. I just don't it understand. Hard. It's it's because the people that are making Star Wars now are not looking out at other things the way George Lucas did. The man who made Star Wars was not making Star Wars. He was making, he was. 
inspired by all these other things. And I think that that's what people have to start to do is, is, is ask themselves, what are we making here? What are we what, trying to what convey? Ins what inspires us outside of Star Wars itself? Money. That's what inspires them. <laughs> but well, the thing is, well, they're the, not making money though. <laughs> yeah, the uh, yeah the uh, the irony is that great stories uh, make people money, and and in order to make great stories, you have to understand what makes a great story, which means you have to have a great knowledge of storytelling itself, and it's it's a bummer. Well, Ace ha Hanlon here with a two dollars super chat. Thank you, Ace. Says Rob, what do you think made L.A. less fun? I think you kind of addressed that. No, I think, I, I mean, I honestly, I think, I think there has been an inversion in, I would say there's been an inversion in youth culture. And since the rise of the internet, it used to be that we young people were seekers. We were out there looking for our place in the world. We were looking for our tribe, you know, our friends, like-minded people. We were looking for art that inspired us, whether it was music or films or or anything. We were going out and finding it because you had to. You had to. Uh, otherwise, it wasn't going to come find you. And now there's been a total inversion. We now carry our black mirrors in our pockets everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it all comes to us. You don't have to make any effort anymore to do anything. You want to meet somebody from the opposite sex? Go on to Tinder. Or whatever, grinder, go wherever. If you're gay, you got grinder. If you're if you're straight, you got Tinder. You got you swipe left, you swipe right. You don't have to put any effort into it. <laughs> I mean, Hell, you know, yep, I know that. I mean, it's and and but that's the thing. Walking into a, a, a there was a whole thing that happened when you you went out for a night with your friends. It was charged. It was exciting, you know, and 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 you didn't know what was going to happen. And, and there was, and you had to make it happen. You know, you had to go in there. You had to go up to a, a, a sidle up to a bar and you had to chat a lovely lady <laughs> or somebody up. Rob, I want you to go ahead and read that, sir. <laughs> no, I always lick my fingers clean. Sharon Peters. Wow. <laughs> it was my face. It was my face that smelled. That was great. It's the best smell in the world. <laughs> Oh God! But I that was Sharon Peters. But 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 Sharon's Sharon's right. I mean, it it was it was. But the thing is, I wouldn't say stuff that because that's you got to bring your finesse game. That's right. But but that was the thing. I mean, that was that's what's happened. There's been a total inversion, and now you know you hear about. I I I, I saw an interesting thing on a clip, a Joe Rogan clip yesterday, and uh, um, oh God, Abigail Schreier or Schreiner. She wrote a really controversial book about uh, gender identity and, and things like that and how like non-binary stuff's become a social contagion. That's not what I'm talking about. Don't get pissed at me for because people get mad. But what she was talking about was that her uh, a friend of hers who is a, um, a research biologist, a, a cell biologist, and she would have students come in and every year they would run experiments and she was kind of mentoring them. And she said something really weird has happened in that she probably has smarter kids today than they've ever been, than she's ever had, more knowledgeable kids, but they're all terrified to run an experiment. They're terrified of, like, they, they don't want to do it. They, they don't want to actually pull the trigger and run an experiment for fear of failing. And and to me, that's that's what an experiment is. And the, the funny thing about, about, you know, going out and w this inversion that's happened is no one's risking anything anymore. People are so terrified that their feelings are going to get hurt or they're going to fail or they're going to, but that was all part of the fun because, you know, when you're out there on the edge, that was li like Matthew McConaughey said, L I V I N living, you know, you got to get out there and go do it. And nowadays I feel that people are, are afraid to, you know, work without a parachute or work without a net. And that was what life was all about. Let's go out and see what happens. Boldly go. And I think that's what's happened to LA. Like I, obviously, I, because I'm old, this same dynamic doesn't work, but I'll tell you something. I, I was first, I went to a Schmodown event in Houston and I wasn't supposed to be there. It was a secret that my character was going to show up. 
And so the, the first night I was there, I had nothing to do. And I'd never been in Houston. And I was staying in a hotel across the street from the um, Space Center, the, which was so cool because I was so excited. I wanted to go there my whole life. But it was I got kicked off the grounds because I was snooping around at night. So I went to this. And I don't know where this is because I don't know Houston very well. But I said to the I got a cab and I said, take me to take me someplace cool here where there's like nightlife. And they took me down to the waterfront. And there was like a pier on the water. It was really cool. This cool like entertainment area. And I went into this club and I basically, I mean, I'm not going to dance. Everyone's there 20 years younger than me, but I, I just kind of went there to observe. So I got myself a drink. It's kind of sit in the corner and I was watching and, and what was, it was shocking to me because people were not talking to each other. The dance floor was pretty empty. People were kind of talking to themselves and everybody had their phones up. Everybody. And the guys were hot. The girls were hotter. And I'm like, this place is a, this is a Shangri-La. I'm like, this is an amazing group of humanity. People, all shape, sizes, colors, creeds, everybody's mingling. And yet no one's actually talking. They're all like walking past each other without making co eye contact or conversations. And I sat there and I was there for like two hours. I think I went, I think I had like three double Double uh, uh, Jamesons, ja double Jameson rocks. That actually three or four. sounds kind of depressing, Rob. It was, I mean, dude. Oh it was God. monumentally depressing. It was so depressing. I'm like, this is a place that was. It was off the hook. I mean, I was, I was, I couldn't stop but think. I, I think it was in '94. Was the first time I went to Mardi Gras in New Orleans. I went to this. There's a place called Pat O'Brien's, which is this gigantic bar and then they have this huge outdoor area and it's you know it's total frat boy central frat girl central but for me i was east of the mississippi so these were not my people i did not know what it was what it was like and but it was off the hook it was off the hook it was crazy the the the, the stuff that was going on there i ended up meeting a girl that looked kind of like halle berry and uh it was pretty interesting because didn't occur to me, but we're like, we started, we're making out in this bar in the South at Mardi Gras. And I'm a white dude from California. And this girl was, she was black. And uh, I could tell at one point when I came up for her, I'm like, maybe we should take this elsewhere because <laughs> people weren't exactly happy with us. I'm like, oh, right. But still, it was so much fun. I mean, I mean, if you're you, if you're having fun, man. I mean, that's all that matters. It I mean, was so much. Fun. It, screw it, everyone, that, man. It, it was, doesn't matter. <laughs> you, like, you still got to remember whose house you're in, though. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, but for your but own the, safety. But at the time, though, it nobody really cared. It was so. The point was, it was so much fun because everybody was talking to each other. Everybody was talking. You know, it was it was the most erotically Mardi Gras was one of the most erotically charged places. Because everybody at that time knew why they were there. There was no belligerency. Nobody was getting in each other's faces. Nobody was nobody was mad. Like, I didn't see... Now you see fights. You see people, they step up to one another. They get in each other's faces. I'm like, why are we doing this? This is getting us away from the, the, <laughs> the task at hand. Yeah, everybody, but, everybody's <clears throat> angry with each other. And that's, yeah. that, that's, that's yeah. another big difference. In, in total difference when i when i moved to la i moved to la in 88 it's just my for I, I after my junior I, I moved i transferred to usc and i the summer that i lived here in, in la i didn't have any i saved up a bunch of money i moved to la so i basically just partied the whole summer i lived here it was it was i came begin to tell you how much fun it was you know i was i would go with i moved down here with a buddy and we would our day was consisted of we'd get our bikes We'd ride from where we lived in West LA down to the beach. We would do a 36 mile ride on the beach. We'd go down to Palos Verdes and back. So we go from Santa Monica down 18 miles down to Palos Verdes and back on the beach. We'd get back to Venice like at three or four and hang out. And I, I was reading books, Star Trek novels. Shh, don't tell anyone. And then, and then um, I got, I got, I'll tell you that. I don't know if I told you a story. I haven't told the story in a while. So, in the summer of 1988, my favorite Star Trek novelist, <laughs> Diane Duane, wrote the very first pocket Star Trek hardcover novel called Spock's World. Now, back then, 
I I helped teach an aerobics class. I was buff. I was, you know, I was, I mean, I was not huge, but I was in, in great shape. And we'd ride bikes, you know, 36. So, but I was reading the new Star Trek novel. <laughs> so I was locked in, man. The, the, the Vulcan wanted to secede from the Federation. So I was sitting there for like three hours reading this book. I couldn't read it fast enough. And in the middle of reading this book, uh, a gigantic wave of sand comes kick gets kicked in my face and it gets all over my mint condition star trek book diane duane hardcover and i look up and there is just this smoking hot california blonde unbelievable body and she's standing there looking at me and, I, and i'm looking around like what 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 happened like did somebody get in a fight i didn't know and she's looking at me and she's she says you are the most conceited asshole i think i've ever seen in my entire life and i'm looking around and i'm like are, are you talking to me and 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 she was like you're the fucking you know she was just going off and i i honestly did not understand what she was saying because I'm, I'm like you know what topring's about to do to the federation and she's she says i've tried to get your attention for the last two hours and you haven't looked up from that book once <laughs> it's like I'm looking at her. And I couldn't even get into it. I couldn't even explain That's to her that oh she God. could have been Farrah Fawcett Majors from Logan's Run, and I would not have noticed her reading the Star Trek novel. Yeah, it, you get you get in into something that's that good, that's that well written. I mean, come on. And I, and I mean, I, I could I mean, I know the book you're talking about, so you know what? I, yeah. I couldn't. It was so funny because I couldn't even. Here was a girl that I would love to have chatted up. But but I had already by my by my complete immersion in this Star Trek novel, destroyed any opportunity. <laughs> and I wanted to tell her. I wanted to look up to. I was looking. I was literally on the ground. First of all, I was hugely pissed that there was sand now in my mint condition book because I put bro darts on the covers. You know the, the library books have to keep like this. Here's a Star Trek novel right here, and I've got these like library bro darts around them. To keep them in mint condition. By the way, this is signed by Boris Leho, the artist who painted that picture, uh, the cover. But I was furious with this girl that she's kicked sand in my face. I didn't. I'm like, I didn't care about me. It was the book. Like you've got granules in the pages of my Star Trek novel, the first Star Trek novel that Pocket Books published in hardcover. After, I mean, I was so mad. I was so mad at her. But I'm looking at her, going, I could get over it. <laughs> but oh, I. Wow. That, that, it was, it was, it was that, that opportunity sailed away. <laughs> I would have thrown sand right back in her face, honestly. Oh, no, is, I, yeah, it was, it was. A, that is a sad and depressing <laughs> story, Rob. Uh, wow. Uh, that, Dan, I want to thank you for being here, man. I know you, you got to get going. So I just wanted to uh, have you on here briefly so you could get a chance to talk to Rob a little bit because of your first impressions of free enterprise. Oh, I'm with, by the way, I'm with Sharon. Uh, we could do 10 lines. <laughs> That's another thing. I used to be able to get great drugs. <laughs> I haven't done drugs. I don't trust anybody. I wouldn't. That's another thing. That, you want to know, seriously, in all seriousness, you know what made LA suck? The quality of drugs just, just tanked in 2005. <laughs> it just went. No more. No, no fun. No fun. As soon as you couldn't trust your old, your as soon as you couldn't trust your drug dealers anymore, the fun went out of it all. <laughs> uh, Four ninety nine super chat from KFB says, "Yes, I love this guy, a Sith Lord, and he's not afraid to talk about gender identity." I wrote a book about this topic. I applaud this guy's bravery. Are you talking about me? Thank you, KFB. Yeah, he's talking about you. Oh, well, look, I don't understand. This is the funny thing that I don't get. Human nature is a part of life. And I I, I don't understand why everyone is, is pretending. It's almost like everyone's pretending they're not human beings. It's it's we it's not just gender identity or or politics. We're pretending that we're not first and foremost creatures of flesh and blood that have desires and that, that want to do things. And it's almost like people are using their activism or they're like, I'm going to fight for what's right. 
But again, to me, that's a way of running away from actually living your life. It's easy to go online and 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 type things that you think are right, or it's easy to go to a protest where you have a bunch of people and they all think like you do, and you're holding your signs. It's a lot harder to go out by yourself and meet people that you don't know, you know, and and to have conversations with people that, you know, I'll tell you something. I have found that in this world, and I've, I haven't traveled as much as I would have liked, but I've lived in foreign countries. I've been around the world. I produced, I produced a movie in Bulgaria and a so, former Soviet satellite state. I have found out that for the most part, when you go out into the world and you meet new people and find new people, it's a pretty great experience. Meeting people that you've never met before, going out, having meals with them, going. I'll tell you something. When you travel, when you travel, always like if you're staying at a hotel, if you're staying at a hotel, go talk to wherever you are. If you go to Europe or something, go go to the concierge or wherever you're staying. If you're even at a hostel and ask somebody, go, hey, man, where's a place that you go? Where do you go hang out? Not a tourist trap or anything, but where do you go? And and where's a bar? Where's a cool pub? And if you, I've found this works every time. You go to the pub like at four o'clock in the afternoon, four or five, you know, between lunch and dinner. And if you're in Spain, it's probably like seven o'clock because you don't go to dinner until late. But you go there and you just hang out. Start talking to the bartender. Start talking to, to people. And people will hear your American accent and they'll be like, hey, are you an American? And then you start talking to them and, and inve in, inevitably somebody will be like, Hey, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're nice, they'll be like, Hey man, I, I'm going to go out with some friends tonight. Well, you should come with us. This always happens in Europe. Go with them, go with them. And, and that you will have the best time. You'll have the best time. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, uh, yeah, Bat Dan had to go. So thanks again for stopping by, uh, Bat Dan, and sharing your thoughts about free enterprise. Uh, uh, Thumper Squid says, Playmates Enterprise D is awesome. Got it at Target. <laughs> I know. I've, I mean, I, I thing is, I still like those Art Asylum versions the best. The Art Asylum ones that they did are great. Really good. Sharon, does Sharon Peters live in L.A.? I, I don't know. Sharon, do you live in L.A.? Hands down, the best pub in L.A. is is the manhole. Okay. I I, I, I don't know. Sharon, do you, Sharon, if you're in the chat still, do you live? Well, you just posted a minute ago. I'm sure you're still here. Yeah, do you live in L.A.? I'm I'm curious, too. Um, she's uh, right. Sharon's definitely, she wants to snort a line or, or 10 with you, Rob. Yeah, I, I, you know, I haven't done drugs in 20 years. Although, I am looking forward to when they make ecstasy legal because we can start getting great MDMA again. <laughs> Just saying. Because it was legal when I was a kid. Uh, but then it made it illegal. But they're using it to treat P ptsd but no those i'm i'm being I'm, I'm in party guy mode but i'm not i'm just an old i'm an old dude now man i i sit at home and talk on youtube and work on my movies that's it okay sharon says no but i have friends who live in la well come on sharon let's party come to la that'd be fun that would be a fun night <laughs> you know what i gotta do you well that's stream the... sharon peters and robert meyer burnett <laughs> well it was that's the thing we, we that's why i'm thinking that you know we what we have to i think the new iteration of all this because there's only so many times you can talk about star wars and star trek and the snyder cut before i mean i think what we need to start focusing on is building a community of people where we're actually out with people yeah i mean i would love to if like i said if if i was making you know not mr beast money but if i was making some decent youtube money i would totally get like some kind of a not a maybe an rv not a full-on recreational vehicle or but some kind of a vehicle and trick it out with a great satellite setup and enough cameras that you it, like a mobile studio and go on like a road trip go like on a couple month road trip and go from state to state to state and just do those events wouldn't that be fun 
and do live YouTube events and 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 just throw a party or throw a call get food trucks to show up and when, throw an when, event when, when when you start getting uh when you start getting that nerd rotic money I know right I mean you know a million a million subs I mean that's that's incredible yeah and the videos I mean the kind of the kind of um the kind of money you make I mean but but Gary does that he puts that money out and he he uh he's very generous yeah so yeah. and uh bat dance justice for, for the five for the, we, suits, for the super chat yeah i didn't get my fives hot toys i want them nice meeting you rob and hashtag justice for fives can't have a star wars talk without giving fives a shout out all right off to bed Right. Well, it's good to meet you, and thanks for the kind words about the film. I, I I swear, I'm I am like, I have been spreading the free enterprise gospel <laughs> for for as long as I can remember, and like I, anytime again, anytime I get a chance to watch it with anybody anybody new, I get excited because I always <laughs> get I always get something new from the film just based on that. It's funny because I, you know, I haven't, um, I haven't, um, I, I just don't, you know, it's, you make a movie, you don't watch it ever again. You know, you watch it with people, but. Yeah, I'm, well, I mean, I, well, that would be, that would be a dream for me to watch Free Enterprise with you in a movie theater. To I would, that, that'd that be a dream. I would love to get it into a movie theater. I, um, I, I, I would be, it's just, it would be incredible. <laughs> just the idea. Yeah. I mean. And Sharon Peters wants an orgy on wheels. So, uh, yes, and we can play a lot of Lords of Acid, things like that. I miss the Lords of Acid. Everybody wants to uh, join Sharon. Sharon is bringing the party. <laughs> well, at least Star Sharon Wars wants to get laid. That's or have you know that's good. <laughs> Sharon Nowadays. wants to have fun. <laughs> hey, that's you know what? That's that's all good. I grew up with that. That's how I learned. Yeah, you got to learn how to. That's navigate how I learned. The, you got to learn how, how I, to navigate the jungle before you. Yeah. Uh, become you a gotta, connoisseur. That's right. You got to wield that tongue machete. That's gotta right. Got to figure out how to get get your way through the underbrush, get to where you're going, clear it clear it away with that uh, tip of your tongue, so you can do the right work in the right place. <laughs> you see, Sharon is thinking along the right lines. She uh, is. She'll fit right <laughs> <Rob>. in. <laughs> I haven't even. I've just been drinking water too. I haven't even, you know. <laughs> wow. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it's you know, you know, bring it, bring in the part, bring in the party. That's yeah. That's what's happening right now. I mean, I, I, I definitely like like your idea of of you know traveling around like that. That'd be really cool. I've always wanted to do that. You know, I, 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 I always thought that I just, you know, if I put more time, I mean, my channel has been growing a little bit, but I've, I should have done, I've just been scattered, you know, between doing whether it's Tango Shalom now and doing white devils and the audio drama. And I don't, I, I'm, I've never been, um, um, Oh, I'm being, I, I'm being yelled at about feeding the dogs. Um, um, I, welcome to the jungle do a little do a little axel rose dance um uh well i don't even remember what i was saying but oh I, I, if i if i had spent as much time as everybody else does on their youtube channels i could have probably made it bigger but you know i'm i'm also kind of i'm an old man too <laughs> so <laughs> well i i i'm just, i was just gonna ask you well since you as if you're getting yelled at about the dogs, do you got to go? Do you yeah. want to wrap this up? Yeah. I um okay. Uh, well, well, I I do. I I apologize. Yeah. No, that's okay. We have a we have a nursing puppy here who's going crazy. Okay, well I well as you know, of course, we'll do this again. You and I collaborate all the time. It's not <laughs> it's not like we won't. Uh but I guess we'll give the last word here to Sharon Peters. Uh, feed the dogs, Rob, and then feed my kitty. So, <laughs> actually, wouldn't shouldn't the reverse be true? Shouldn't I am the one that dines on your kitty? Is that how it works? I don't know. <laughs> wow. Okay. 
<laughs> well, on that note, I want to thank you, Rob, for being here for episode 96 of Late Night Q&A with Zod Rider. It's always a pleasure to hang out with you and to talk about all these wonderful things. And always a pleasure for Sharon Peters to pop up in the chat with all of her uh, all of her spirited comments and amazing, <laughs> uh, amazing non non twenty twenty four ways of thinking. Yeah, and that's we, good. We need to get back to this. Yeah, definitely. you know, I mean, it's 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 it. it you know, we get it. We have to get, we have to bring back the fun. Yeah, bring yeah, back absolutely. the fun. That's going to be, you know, bring the fun back to the the youth of America. I mean, you hear about everybody's on antidepressants and suffering from anxiety and all this craziness. Um, yeah, we got to bring back the fun. Bring the party back. Get rid of the the malevolence. Get rid of the anxiety. Let's just have some fun, man. Let's get together. Have some fellowship. Have a few drinks. Sharon says bring back the bush. <laughs> I told my wife that, actually. <laughs> Okay. And uh, Darth Plato says this is the best show ever. Uh, well, you know, I'm sure we'll do more. Um, Demonetized. This is, just, this is just the beginning. But uh, on that note, thank you, chat. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Much appreciated. Thank you again, Rob. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow where I interview actress Nessa Noel. So be here tomorrow for another episode of Late Night Q&A. Good night, everybody. Thanks for being here. <laughs>